You've been hearing us talk about Imperial Yeast for a while now, and that's because we absolutely love the stuff. With 200 billion cells in each pitch right pouch, we rarely need to make starters these days. While originally based out of Portland, Oregon, Imperial Yeast has expanded to the East Coast, meaning even more people have access to their incredible lineup of yeast, including popular strains like AO7 Flagship, A38 Juice, AO9 Pub, and a Brewlosophy favorite, L17 Harvest. So, so good. Whether you brew at home or on the commercial scale, Imperial Yeast has what you need to make the best beer possible. You can check out all of their available strains and start your planning at imperialyeast.com. Besides water, the most prominent ingredient used to make beer is grain, namely malted barley. While there are a number of barley varieties that can be used to make brewer's malt, the vast majority are what's referred to as Turo, a term that's often erroneously used in place of a malt's actual name, though Turo isn't all that's out there. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to discuss the impact of brewing with six-row malt, particularly as it relates to American lager. Yeah, two row versus six six row. I mean, this seems to be the question, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, and now it's kind of like fallen away. I'm not sure it's as big of a deal uh, anymore for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about uh, on the show. But yeah, six row, uh, six row malt. That's a type of malt that you can brew with. Uh, and does how does it compare to two row? So that's the uh, that's the question that we'll be discussing today. Absolutely. Even before I started making my own lagers, I was pretty well aware uh, that six row malt was a thing, but I'd, I'd been taught that it was reserved just for like the big commercial brewery out there. Uh, While I've certainly seen it before in homebrew shops in the years that I've been brewing, I've never actually used the stuff myself. uh, And I don't know many people who have. I'm looking forward to chatting and learning more about this unique but not that unique brewer's malt today. All right. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month's guest is Clay Disney from Jaded Brewing, makers of some of the world's fastest immersion chillers. I've known Clay for almost as long as Brewlosophy has been around. In fact, if I recall correctly, he's uh, our very first real sponsor. Uh, Jaded Brewing was the very first real sponsor of Brewlosophy. Uh, And the fact he's still around today is something we're really grateful for. In addition to his expertise on chilling, Clay's just a fun dude uh, who's sure to put on a great session. To be a part of it, you have to make your pledge of just $3 or more at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. No later than Friday, February 24th, 2023, as Clay's going to be taking questions that Saturday, the 24th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts that allows you to leave those ratings and reviews, we would appreciate it immensely as it helps those people who haven't heard of us yet to more easily find the show. And, And we also just like knowing what you think. Massive thanks to everybody out there who's uh, made the effort to review the show recently. We've, we're noticing those uh, reviews are coming in quite uh, quite a bit lately, and it's been really cool to, to see what you think about us. So, Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who offer brewers various options for high-quality, reasonably priced electric brewing rib- rigs in various voltages and sizes. I've used their 120-volt system uh, for 5-gallon batches and just jumped into the 240-volt 10-gallon setup. I'm telling you, these things are awesome. Clawhammer Supply really puts the effort into ensuring their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible. If you're not ready to make the jump to electric, they also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits. If you've been considering going electric, do yourself a favor and visit clawhammersupply.com. We're confident you're going to love their stuff just as much as we do. Listener Wade Wallinger uh, had some feedback after listening to episode 263, where we talked about boiling wort in a covered kettle. Wade said, I recall a homebrew con presentation of research on the impact of cooling rate uh, after the end of the boil oil having a dramatic impact on DMS in the final beer, as well as malt type. Uh, As you pointed out, Pilsner malt is lightly kilned and has a lot of SMM to convert to DMS while the wort is hot. As I recall from the presentation, the DMS is very quickly evaporated with the agitation of the boiling liquid, so I'm not surprised a covered boil would have much of an impact. When the heat is stopped, uh, the SMM to DMS conversion continues, but without the uh, the rolling boil, it results in retained DMS in the wort. The presentation showed data for various lengths of time. 
time to cool the hot wort, and longer cooling times had a dramatic impact on DMS in the final wort. The effect is less dramatic for other malts. I recall pale malt was compared to Pilsner, uh, Pilsner malt in the presentation simply because the amount of SMM in other malts is not as high. Conclusion, a rapid cooling will result in little DMS being generated and retained in the wort. Uh, you use a jaded chiller, so I suspect you cooled your wort in the experiment quickly and thus no DMS effect. I did chill it quickly and the no DMS effect was definitely there. I mean, there was no DMS in those beers. Uh, but what do you think about the rapid chilling thing, Cade? That's not something I'd actually really considered when it comes to the SMM to DMS conversion. Yeah, that would have been really cool to talk about in that episode, too, if I had thought about it uh, beforehand. That's really interesting because it makes a lot of sense, right? You're not having the DMS that, that's being converted because you've chilled it so quickly. You've reduced it to uh, to below those temperatures, right? Whatever it was, 99 Fahrenheit or 37 C or something like that. Um, well, no, I'm sorry. That was the off-boiling of DMS. That's not the conversion temperature. The conversion temperature is much higher, like above 180 Fahrenheit. Um uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. That's an interesting way to think about it. I wonder if that's been sort of one of the reasons why we've been so uh, you and I, Marshall, have had so much trouble getting DMS in our own beers. Right. Right. I've never not chilled, not chilled quickly. Right. I mean, I've always chilled as fast as I can, like with the, you know, within six to ten minutes, my beer is from boiling down to pitching temperature. Um, you know, uh, uh, for a while there, I was using the jaded chiller and now I'm using the one that came with the brow supply units that I brew with. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, maybe that's a really uh, important thing. And maybe that's why um, some home brewers have a, a more difficult time with DMS uh, than you or I have, Marshall. Yeah, I, that, I think that's a really interesting, interesting question. You know, it makes me think of the folks who are doing this no chill thing and some of the critiques, I suppose, that I've heard about the no chill process or that method. Uh, and this is just where you rack really hot wort and do a like a, a, a PTE cube, or I guess it's a HDPE cube, a plastic, you know, a plastic container, you seal it up and then you let it chill overnight uh, really slowly. And one of the critiques that I've heard is that people get this kind of uh, what I would call a DMS type of off, fla off flavor. It's not corny as people usually refer to DMS as, but it has this kind of like grainy grassy thing going on. Um, I've I've had a couple of, of uh, no chill beers. Some have been phenomenal with no uh, off flavor or whatever that is. Uh, but some of some of them have definitely had this kind of unique characteristic. Now I'm wondering, you know, if maybe that wasn't some form of DMS because of that slow chilling time. I had never really considered, like I said earlier, uh, the you know chilling duration uh, as being uh, some sort of a factor playing into the formation of DMS. So it makes sense to me, Wade, and I appreciate you writing in with your feedback. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. If you haven't already, please go subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show, at youtube.com slash at the Brewlosophy Show. That's with a U. You do not need to have the umlaut. Uh, and the at symbol, The Brewlosophy Show. Uh, Martin has been really hard at work creating what we think is going to be some really great content, and we'd love for you to check it out. First episode drops very, very soon. A little birdie tells me it may actually be uh, the first week of February, so keep your eyes peeled. All right, when we're back from this break, our focus will be on Six Row Malt and its role in American Lager. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. When I started brewing nearly two decades ago, I didn't know that much about beer, just that I liked how the limited variety of what I drank at that point tasted. Uh, while I'd been introduced to craft beer, this was nearly, you know, in the early 
2000, so nearly 23 years ago, uh, and there weren't that many options. So a good chunk of what lined my refrigerator shelves was good old American lager, a favorite of mine at the time being Coors Banquet, which I still rather enjoy these days. Uh, as I got more and more obsessed, though, I began researching various beer styles, and that's really when I learned that these classic crushable American lagers were often made with six-row malt as opposed to two-row, uh, the two-row that I was familiar with uh, from home brewing. Cade, let's spend a minute breaking down what exactly six-row malt is, how it differs from two-row, and why brewers might choose it over uh, two-row in their brewing. Yeah, six-row uh, versus two-row is this technical term called inflorescence. And I, I sound really smart saying that term, but I didn't know it um, until I learned that from Dr. Pat Hayes, who is the barley breeder here at OSU. Um, so check out episode 37 of the Brew Lab for uh, uh, an episode that I call Barley Basics. We just talk about a whole bunch of different stuff like inflorescence, growth habit, uh, you know, what type, what part of the year it grows in, uh, meaning like winter or summer or, or fall uh, or spring when it grows. We learned a lot of interesting stuff uh, from that conversation with with uh, Dr. Pat Hayes and he's been doing this for like 30 or 40 years okay so like he's literally the guy in barley uh, I mean he's he's uh, contributed so much different research and so many different things uh, to barley and its breeding and all that comes back to that's a long-winded way of saying all the differences in six row and two row is the way the grain looks all right they call it inflorescence or physical morphology but it's just the way that it looks that's that's um more or less the 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 main difference between two row or six row and there's some other things that might impact brewing conditions uh which we'll talk about in a little bit but again two row barley just has these uh, it's it's got two rows of spikelets uh, those they're spikelets again is the technical term but they look like little kernels mm -hmm. right and they go they go along down the stem and so there's two rows of the spikelets um with, you know with, with two row barley with six row there's it's more like a triangle or it forms like a, like a six-pointed diamond shape or a six-pointed star shape. Right. So there's like three on one side and three on the other side. They're not directly in a row. They're more like two on the bottom and the one on the top in this little like star shape. Um, and that's what it is. But that's the essentially the difference, the inflorescence, uh, two row versus six row barley. Yeah, I actually, I may have misread this, but when I was doing research for this show, and obviously there's a reason I'm glad <laughs> that you and I are the ones talking about this because you know far more about it being a student of Pat Hayes, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, and whereas I know nothing about this stuff, uh, but but I I'm, I I'm certain you know I've got experience with the whole two row six row you know conversation when it comes to brewing and such. But I, I was reading yeah, yeah. I was reading about the differences between two row and six row, and and one of the things that I read that that I thought was really interesting is how uh, and again correct me if I'm wrong here, Cade, but that the six row versus two row thing is determined by a one in thirty thousand chance uh, genetic mutation uh, that that it could be like a two row barley uh, that that just had this slight genetic muta mutation and now it's a six row and that's what made the six row barley and of course they've been able to isolate that and breed it and grow it and, and be more pre predictable about it but I thought that was pretty interesting and it, and it really does kind of open your mind to how agronomics works in general uh, in terms of breeding certain types of things for consumables and whatnot but um, but it is interesting because as similar as they are there's a lot of I don't want to call it controversy but there are absolutely some pretty set opinions uh, about the differences that two row and six row in part on a, on a organoleptic level. Uh, but there's also, and we're going to get into this right now, we're going to talk about the, the differences in terms of uh, the more, I guess we could call them objective measures uh, in terms of using two row and six row mm -hmm. barley. Yeah, for sure. And you heard that one out of 30,000 genes, uh, hopefully by listening to my podcast <laughs> or by editing it, uh, because Dr. Hayes uh, mentioned that on the show. Um, that was one of the the cool facts that he shared in episode 37 of the brew lab is that it is it's one gene out of 30,000 genes in barley it's one gene that makes the difference between two row and six row so crazy and to him and to him like over his breeding career that's been sort of one of those things it's like well okay well then it can't be all that important right or not maybe not necessarily all that important but why are there all these these uh you know beliefs that two row is better than six row in this way or that six row has this or that that two row doesn't um and so a large part of his career of pat's career was uh 
essentially breeding out the differences between two row and six row to make them the same, right? So if you look historically in the United States, six row um, made more sense for brewers. Um, it was almost exclusively grown in America. The rest of the world was all growing two row. So why the difference, right? What, what's the point here? Um, and in, in my mind, and this is just Cade talking, this is not Pat Hayes talking or, or anybody else. This is just me talking. But in my mind, it comes down to the fact of what kind of beer we were brewed in america mm. these germans um had and um you know europeans had come over and they brought their lager beers with them and they wanted to make lagers here in the united states but there's no two row so but there what there is is a lot of corn there's a lot of corn around and and, and maize and and some of these other cereal grains that they can get their hands on easily and what they found out was if you mix six row with those other cereal grains like corn or oats or, or or whatever, then you can get a really nice crisp lager that's not the same, but it's at least closer to what they were drinking over in in Europe and especially in like Germany and and, and Czech Republic and all those places. You know, so to me that's sort of the history of six row barley. It's not necessarily that it was you know uh, I don't know that that there's this like magical thing that like six row is just so different than two row or anything like that. It's like no, there's just like a use um there's a tradition that influences the use of two row versus six row barley does that make sense yeah well and and the way i think about it as well it does it's very clear uh kate and i appreciate the explanation the, the one of the things that i thought as well is that you know you had these these european brewers coming over to the united states and we just so happen not by any other reason than it just grows well uh to be growing six row barley primarily for livestock feed uh and so so there, there's all of this barley there barley is barley is barley i can imagine these brewers are like, hey, at least we've got something. Uh, and then they found that, like you said, when they blend it with these other cereal gra- grains, they get they get adequate conversion. They're able to ferment these beers out. They taste, you know, reasonably good. In my opinion, I think they're pretty great. Uh, and it yeah. worked and it worked out. But but y- you can start to see right there where it becomes anytime something like that happens, whether it's intentional or not, when there's a division opinions start to form and then you and then that kind of grows into its own religion almost like you got to oh, yeah. have this you got to have that uh but but again there's reasons that one might opt to go with uh six row over two row uh you know the the truth of the matter is in in lab testing and i believe i did hear pat hayes talk about this as well that uh there's you know six row has more protein than two row which can lead to quicker conversion during the mash uh that's a pro uh and it does it also a con of that i suppose is that it can increase the risk of protein haze which isn't really an issue for these huge brewers who are like massively filtering everything that they create so again you've got six row malt which is cheaper because of the way that it's grown and the or the i I suppose because it's grown so vastly for the livestock uh, side of things uh so you can get more for less money and as long as you have the ability to kind of deal with whatever cons might come from using that let's say that's protein haze then you're fine to use it right i mean that's kind of the way my brain thinks about it yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, there's a couple things in there, right, that you mentioned, like six row being cheaper than two row. And that's one of those things I wonder if it's chicken or egg, mm. um, because as as you dig into this as an, and as you read more about it, six row was was was, you know, used for feed. Yeah, but it was also used for brewing. And for a long time, AMBA, which is the American Malting Barley Association, released gu- guidelines for uh, growing six row barley so that it could then be malted. And huh. so that that version of six row was sold at a premium. But they've stopped doing that. And something now like 85% of all acreage grown in the United States is two-row barley. Um, so it makes me kind of wonder, right? Like, is was malt was six-row originally like way more expensive than two-row? And then two-row was cheap, so they switched to that. And now we're going to switch <laughs> back to six-row? I mean, I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, but that protein content thing is super important. Like you said, quicker conversion in the mash and also meaning higher enzyme content, yeah. right? Um, and, and, and so that's a really important thing. But... Higher protein also can lead to other issues. Haze, you mentioned. Also, esters and higher alcohol production. Um, and so proteins are something that's still rigorously being studied. We still don't know everything we we would want to know about those. I mean, Dr. Glenn Fox and the UC Davis folks are doing a whole bunch of proteomics research, which is the study of proteins, um, to look at a whole bunch of different modern brewing research questions like mash conversion, you know, um, all sorts of issues. Um, and there's a bunch of really cool stuff coming out of that lab and a bunch of stuff that's going to come out of it in the future but that enzyme content is huge and so we mentioned you know adjuncts right corn 
is cheaper than both six row and two row, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so if you're a big brewery and you're looking to just crank out beer, um, you know, that, that puts pressure on the brewery to, to, you know, have higher extracts, right? That's a big one. So you want more sugar content so that you can then ferment that into alcohol. And you also need cheaper ingredients to do that. But, you know, as we found out, anybody that's brewed a 100% corn beer, it doesn't taste all that great or it doesn't taste as good as barley <laughs> beer. And so I think that's one of the big reasons why barley is is still here. Um, I don't know if the big brewers are still heavily reliant on six row. That's an interesting question. I don't have that information. I should have asked Pat that um, because a lot of modern two rows have way more than enough enzyme capacity to fully convert even when brewing with adjunct beers. I mean, I know you, Marshall, have made beers with adjuncts and two row and haven't had any issues right yeah yeah totally and and you know i don't want to go too deep down into the uh, diastatic power conversation but when we're yeah. talking about higher enzyme content that's es- essentially what we're talking about is that when when you use barley with these other adjunct grains these other cereal grains that cannot self convert that diastatic power is is the term that we use to refer to that that barley's ability to convert these other starches into fermentable sugar we'll keep it simple on that and ostensibly uh, six row has a higher enzyme content, more diastatic power than two row. Though these days, with the effic- with how, just how incredibly, uh, uh, I guess, the good malting has gotten, uh, and how efficient and 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 high in diastatic power that standard two row malts are these days, I'm not even sure that that's a, an argument that one can make as a reason why you might opt to use six row over over two row, uh, because they're they're just so similar. I mean, the differences would be basically nil, but it makes sense at least back in the you know 20 plus years ago if breweries these big breweries were choosing to use six row for that reason you know if two row wasn't as, as good at conversion if it had that lower enzyme content that would make sense to me as well uh, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to six row is that the, it has a thicker husk than two row malt apparently uh, which can improve loudering efficiency which again on these huge systems these 60 to 100 barrel systems whatever even if you're just brewing on a 15 or 20 barrel system that can be really helpful you know to, to reduce the risks of a stuck sparge or something like that. However, one argument that you can make about that is that you might you, it might increase your risk of extracting some tannins, which is never desirable, you know, and especially like a pale lager where everything is on display. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, the, the husks are, are a big deal. And that's also part of the inflorescence. Right. I mean, there's not as much room for plant material to grow, um, you know, or, or uh, let me let me uh, let me back that up. The kernels uh, are, are bigger in two row barley. Right. So there's a lot less like there's a more surface area to cover, I guess, uh, on each spikelet. Um, you know, so it's so it's pretty interesting. I mean, that's why there's like a thicker husk, uh, or I'm sorry, back it up again. There's a thicker <laughs> husk in two row. There we go, in two row, right? So there's two. There's there's just not as much surface area that is required to cover. The two row kernels are a little bit more plump, but they're still that husk is able to grow and get a little thicker. Um, you know, so these are interesting things. So we've talked about a bunch of difference in six row versus two row, right? Different protein content, thicker husk. Uh, you know, there's one that we haven't mentioned yet, which is that it's purportedly more likely to form DMS. Um, and I think that's likely due to issues with kilning um you know that that the three uh, the six row is just has smaller kernel size it's harder to get in there and you know make sure that everything is properly steeped and germinated and then uh that everything's been kilned appropriately and dried back down so there's just a lot more uh things that you have to control instead of dealing with just two spikelets you're dealing with six spikelets right i mean if that makes it uh that that simple but there's all these differences between six row and, and and two row right there's all these purported things that could be different it's amazing to me to just step back for a second and like you mentioned marshall go wait a minute this is just one uh one out of thirty thousand genes and it sounds like <laughs> it is having a really big deal um in, in the difference between these two these two barley breeding uh or you know two barley influences inflorescences right yeah it's it's interesting to me too I, I think about this kind of stuff on kind of a macro level all the time about i remember i was in high school a high school biology class and the teacher this really odd lady uh but she had cool ways of kind of describing things and she 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 had this analogy for uh, genes and the whole genetic composition
composition of the human body and everything, really. Uh, or she said it's like a domino effect where one domino hitting the, will start this entire chain reaction that ultimately uh, it results in you looking the way that you look and having the eye color that you do. And we, we distill it down to like, you know, X's and Y's and all of this stuff. But the reality is, is that every aspect of anything that's a living, that, that's living, whether that's barley or a human being, is a function. The way that, it's, uh, that, that it presents and, and tastes or, you know, whatever it does is a function of those genetics. So the fact that one out of 30,000 genes is, is what basically creates this six row thing Definitely in my mind, I'm going, well, it could also have an impact on some of the perceptible aspects when you're using it to make Mm -hmm. beer. So uh, I just think it's fascinating. And I just want to clarify one thing. I know it's not a big deal, the whole thicker husk thing. I read that six row has a thicker husk. Maybe I misread that. It could be that two row does. But I I think the point of that conversation, really, that that is not something we're going to hang our hat on, is that it probably doesn't matter because the husk is good on either two row or six row for loudering efficiency. Probably not a big deal. We're just looking for you know the finest of differences. So I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, by especially for those people who are brewing using a continuous or a fly sparge system, I think as long as you cut off your you know your your sparging at the proper point, you really don't have much to worry about in terms of tannin extraction, regardless of husk thickness. So, I, in case anyone was confused as to our conversation on that, now in when we think about, I don't know about you, Cade, but when I think about the use of of six row barley, I almost exclusively think about American pale lager. I mean, it, that is like where my brain goes. I know that it, it had some use. I believe it was in in the UK for a while there, in part as a a, a function of uh, like trade agreements and such. And so, uh, and again, this is just based on some some very uh, limited reading of, of six row and its use in brewing. Uh, but but really, what I think about is you know American lager. Bud Miller Coors and uh, the the beers that I I kind of you know uh, so to speak was raised hearing were <laughs> relied on six row uh, six row malt and when we think about American lager the way the BJCP the 2021 BJCP guidelines uh, describes this style is a very pale highly carbonated light bodied well attenuated lager with a very neutral flavor profile and low bitterness served very cold it can be very refreshing and thirst quenching drink I g- agree completely with that but I think <laughs> yeah. I think the focus there is a very neutral flavor profile. Profile. When you when you're drinking an American lager, you don't want anything other than American lager flavor. You don't want anything in the way. And if it's there, you're likely going to notice it because it's like I said earlier, it's just completely on display. And so, you know, it, it, in terms of the grains that you use, it's worth considering what impact two row might have over six row. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why the use of six, two row or six row in American lager? Was it just a function of what was available at the time? Or was there something more that those brewers were looking to get by using six row, at least at the time? Because it does sound like most are using two row nowadays. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's kind of like history versus, you know, history and tradition versus like modern brewing practices, but uh, but uh, 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 to, uh, to an extent. But yeah, history and tradition, six row with up to, you know, 40 percent rice or corn. Uh, that's a very traditional American pale lager. Right. Yep. And I think uh, I mean, for a long time, that's how it was brewed. I mean, again, I don't I don't have any insight into any of the macro breweries, so I don't know if they're using two row or six row based on the just sheer amount of grain that's being made. Eighty five percent. I can't imagine that all of that 85% is going to craft beer, craft beer right? <clears throat> um, so there's got to be uh, some some of that two row that's going to, to macro breweries. But that enzyme package is what was really important. And even still, right, this is there's no question I, it, that that um, modern breweries, most, especially the big breweries, use what's called high gravity brewing. So they don't when they're brewing Bud Light, Miller Light, or Coors Light, or at least this is my understanding, they're not brewing a four and a half percent beer right out of the fermenter and or right out of the kettle and then putting that in the fermenter. They're brewing a, a one that's a huge, that's a high gravity, like eighteen Play-Doh, right? I mean, they're gonna they're brewing a really big beer that they're then gonna let ferment um, and then they're gonna trim it. They're gonna trim it with water down to target levels, and that's because they want every single beer everywhere in the world to taste exactly the same, no matter where it is, no matter what packaging conditions it's been through, no matter how it's been treated, they want it to taste just as good every single time you drink it. Serve it very cold, and it's very refreshing and a thirst-quenching drink. 
um, and to me, I've said this a bunch of times. They, uh, you know, I think that what they've been able to do, the macro breweries have been able to do, is incredibly incres- impressive. The number of barrels of beer that they brew each year, they're able to hit everything. Mm-hmm. But a large part of that is because of their history and traditions, which started with six row, right, and adjunct, and that's how they sort of developed this high gravity brewing practice because you've got a high enzymatic. Uh, you know, capacity from six row malt, which means you can throw a whole bunch of adjuncts in there, right. make a really high AB, you know, a really high starting gravity beer, and then trim it back down uh, to where you need it. And and to me, like that's like, oh, this is really cool when you think about this. And this is one of those ingredients, six row barley, which may have been prolonged or like you know taken along because breweries are using it, and especially the macro breweries for American lager style. So it's kind of one of those things to me that's find it kind of interesting. Is six row barley dependent on American lager? I can't think of any other styles where six row barley is used. Um, and it does apparently contribute a, uh, or, or ostensibly contribute a flavor, right? I mean, otherwise the big breweries wouldn't be doing it. Why would they still be doing that if it's not actually contributing some flavor uh, that they need or want? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I, I did a little poking around on the internet just to see if if uh, Bud Miller and Coors would admit what types of grains they're using. Uh, what I found was uh, that Coors Light and Coors or probably Coors Banquet, in fact, is 100% two-row these days. This is just what I read online. Again, like you said earlier, it's just Cade. This is just what I read. It may be wrong. I don't think I read it from directly from the breweries. It was somebody else's like blog or whatever. Well, my favorite, my favorite mass market lager is Miller Lite. Everybody knows that. I wish they would sponsor us. I love them that much. They're, it's super good. It's what, it's, the, it's what I drink instead <laughs> of water if I, if I need to you know rehydrate on a hot summer day. Uh, apparently, Miller Lite relies on six row malt or a blend of six row and two row malt. And one of the things, one of the reasons I love Miller Lite as much as I do is because of the malt character that I get from it. It has this really nice toasty bready thing that I definitely don't get in Coors Light. And that is a little bit different in my opinion in in Bud Light. Uh, but, But Miller Lite just has this nice kind of toasty bready thing. And I've always wondered, is that because of the two row malt or six row malt uh, or this blend that they're using? Who knows? Now, I've never brewed with six row malt, but as regular listeners of this show are well aware, I have no shame like I just did admitting my love of good American lager, American light lager. Uh, and and we know that some of those like Miller Light is brewed with a portion of six row barley malt. We were curious what kind of perceptible impact six row malt has compared to two row and designed an experiment to test it out. We're going to be getting into those results right after this break. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Thank you. 
Considering the sheer amount of mass market American lager I drank prior to it being legal, as well as my current obsession with Miller Lite, there's a good chance I've consumed at least an equal amount of beer made with six row malt as I have those made with two row. I can't say I've noticed much of a difference personally. I, I did, like I mentioned earlier, I have this thing with Miller Lite and the malt character I get from that. Uh, while I haven't done a formal comparison myself, contributor Jake Houlihan was equally as curious as I was and performed a really neat experiment to see for himself. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that Jake did this one because um, uh, this was one of those things I think a lot of homebrewers have questions about, right? I myself had questions about this. This is why I got Pat Hayes on the Brew Lab. Uh, you know, so Jake made a dual five gallon batches of dun dun dun. American lager, <laughs> right? right? Um, and he used um, 100% of either two-row pale malt or six-row pale malt, both from the same malting supplier. So both sourced from RAR. Yes, I love that. I love that he did that. This is a well-thought-out experiment, in my opinion. You know, one of the things uh, that we are we get questioned about, and understandably, often is, well, you know, did you get your malt, if you're doing any sort of a comparison, especially, is, you know, how similar were those malts on the other level? So the fact that they both came from RAR. I believe they were both very similarly kilned. So they were down in that one, you know, one, one and a half uh, love, degrees love a bond color. Uh, and he got them at the same time. Now, that's not to say that they came from the same exact batch or, you know, whatever. They were, they were kilned exactly on the same day. But he he did his due diligence on this. And he, and he really did try to get, uh, you know, these the, the malts to be as similar as possible in all respects, except for that two row versus six row piece. Yeah, exactly. I mean, control as many factors as you can, but the but the uh, you know the reason it's two row versus six row is because they came from a different seed, they grew in different fields under different conditions, all that sort of stuff, right? But you know, the other thing too here was um, I, I if I remember correctly, I think there were some comments at the time for people that were saying, oh, you know, we'd never do a hundred percent six row you know pale malt batch. And it's like, yeah, that's great, that's probably true, at least not now, um, you know. But uh, you know we're doing a grain comparison, right? It's yeah, two yeah. row versus six row and they can both make beer. So, yeah. so that's the whole purpose of this uh, experiment. So I just wanted to address that feedback as well. Um, so then uh, he did his normal brewing process from that point, right? So he mashed both batches at 150 Fahrenheit, 66 Celsius for 60 minutes before removing the grains and collecting the sweet wort. Um, he did a, take a mash pH. The two row was at 5.32 pH and the six row was at 5.31 pH, which is virtually exactly the same. I mean, that's probably instrument error, if anything. Uh, then he boiled the beers for 60 minutes. He added his hops at the at, according to the hop schedule. So that's 50 gram, or I'm sorry, five grams of Magnum at six, 60 minutes and eight grams of, and I, don't, I always pronounce this one wrong, Pico, Peco. I think How it's Peco, it? yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so eight grams of Peco at 30 minutes. Um, and then no other hop addition, right? Very traditional American lager boil. You just want very light bitterness and not very much hop flavor or character. Uh, so then after the boil, he quickly chilled the wort into identical volumes. Um, uh, into He chilled the wort and then racked identical volumes into sanitized fermenters uh, and then measured the OG, the original gravity. So the two row was 1042 OG and the six row was 1040 OG. There are a number of reasons for a this small of a difference that it could be just that the uh, you know b- the boil vigor on one was ever so slightly stronger than the other. Though, you know, given I know Jake is a is a neurotic brewer kind of like us Cade. So I'm 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 wont to believe that this was a function of the different malts and, and their different I guess their different uh, sugars or the conversion rates or whatever it was. Uh, and and so again, this to me is not anything to worry about about a small little two specific gravity point difference, but it is interesting to note. And, and it does kind of start again, it, like thinking of that domino thing, it does kind of start me thinking, okay, is this going to have some sort of uh, other impact as well? These, these differences between these malts. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of a domino, right? Is this going to have other impact? But to me, this is also an example of what we were talking about earlier. I mean, those beers are pretty damn close. Yeah, right? yeah, totally. I mean, 1042 or 1040, modern bre- modern breeding efforts at work right there. Uh, so we'll see if that makes a difference, though, later. Uh, Wurtz were then allowed uh, to chill, and then they uh, got crashed to 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius in, their chamber, in his chamber uh, before he pitched a large starter of Imperial L17 Harvest, uh, which was evenly spit between them split between them i love harvest that's one of my favorites one of the best um and 
After a week of fermentation, activity was absent, uh, so he took hydrometer measurements to make sure everything was done. The two-row batch was at 1011 FG, and the six-row batch was at 1010 FG. So, you know, 1042 to 1011 for the two-row batch, 1040 to 1010 for the six-row batch. We are now looking at literally a one-point difference overall. I, I, this, to me, is just they're too close to say that there's there's a massive difference in terms of that more objective, uh, you know, statistical side the observable side of uh, the brewing stuff, right? So, so mm-hmm. yeah, maybe the two row converted a little bit more, but the attenuation was the, was essentially the same between the two. Um, at this point, again, those differences that we saw in the beginning are starting to kind of come back to get come back to being not too different. Uh, so, but still, I'm curious, right? It, 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 did this have some other impact? Yeah, these beers are definitely more similar than they are different so far. And who knows? I mean, there might have been something on the malt spec sheet that was just like a half a percent off, or sure, something like that. You know, you never know. All right, so then, uh, so the beers are done. Uh, so then he pressure transferred them uh, to CO2 purged kegs and placed them in his keezer where he allowed them to lager for four weeks before they were ready for evaluation. Um, and so uh, before he, uh, we, he served them uh, to tasters or we get his preference, uh, we should talk about the objective observations. So, I mean, looking at the pictures, what did you think, Marshall? I mean, I'll tell you, but those beers, not only do they look beautiful, I mean, they, they I really appreciate the fact that Jake for this experiment as as willy-nilly as we sometimes get with our uh our lager brewing process you know um he he really went the more traditional route on this he cold fermented it at 50 degrees fahrenheit and then he lagered it for an entire month i mean this is a this is a low og beer and he still went four four full weeks and i'll tell you that lagering period did a lot for this beer because it is beautiful they're they're crystal clear uh you know very low foam kind of how you would expect on an, an american lager um and particularly uh, you know what's interesting to me about this one is that he didn't use any adjuncts which that would be a fun kind of follow-up experiment right to see mm-hmm. does two row do a different thing when you've got 40 percent flaked maize or something versus six row but the color to me looks identical which again speaks to the similarity in the those malts from the beginning from rar is that they were probably killed to a very similar i mean obviously were killed to a very similar color because those beers look identical to my eyes. Yeah. Oh man. Dibs on that experiment. 40%, you know, adjunct with a, uh, you know, two row versus six row. Yes. I'll yeah. take 10 gallons of American lager. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, to me, they look absolutely clear too, right? They look perfect. His head, he's got a little bit too much foam <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> for, for an American lager. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but otherwise, no, it looks great. And if you look at the pictures, there's very little foam on there, right? <laughs> there's not a lot. Um, but yeah, I think they look great. Uh, so then uh, Jeff tasted them, or I'm sorry, Jeff, Jake, Jake tasted them himself. Um, and according to his own personal impressions, he was consistently and confidently able to pick the odd beer out in multiple triangle tests. Um, and, uh, so he said that he perceived the beer with two row as being more flavorful with the rich malty sweetness while the six row beer had what he described as a dirty character. <laughs> 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 and, then, and then I love that. Then he's like, yeah, neither were bad. I enjoyed drinking them both, uh, but I definitely preferred the version made with two row. So I think dirt, the dirty character thing. I mean, we're not going to, you know, change what some, how somebody describes something. And we all have different ways of describing things, but this is a good example of where one person's dirty is not the other, another person's. <laughs> I talked to him about this yeah. a little bit, and I think a few people asked him about it on the article and he kind of explained it more by dirty. I think what Jake meant is it had a more kind of gritty, earthy characteristic as opposed to the more malt that that malt sweetness that you expect you know when you're using regular two row still you know I'm looking at this going the fact that he consistently and confidently was able to distinguish these beers in his own blind triangle you know semi blind triangle tests that that's pretty telling to me because I you know I'm looking at this going all right we've done the research we know that six row and two row really aren't that different It, it I believe that they're made from the same species, but maybe not, you know, I, and, and maybe that's why these were tasted different to Jake. Um, but the fact that he could describe this difference in a way that makes sense to me, not that I would think that it is dirty tasting, but I know what, I know that, 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 that experience where you're like, this tastes more like the earth, you know, mm-hmm, um, yeah. as opposed to what we've turned two row malt into, you know, this sweet kind of a gr- granola flavored thing. Uh, it, it's it, this, 
six row, he didn't get that from it. He liked both, and I can understand that as well. He's not dinging the six row beer. He's just saying the two row one tasted different than the six row one, and he did have a slight preference for the two row one, but again, both, in his opinion, tasted good, and he enjoyed drinking them. I would have been curious to have him compare his six row one to a commercial beer that we know. We'd have to figure out which one is made with six row malt for sure, but compare it to that and see if he gets that same kind of, quote, dirty character that he got out of his six row batch. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, that's one of those things, too. Does dirty just mean not clean, right? I mean, we talked about neutral flavor profile, no strong flavor. So did it just have something that was just a little bit off? I mean, in a Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, something just a little bit off is going to shine through like crazy. Absolutely. You're going to really notice it. Even if it's not necessarily off-putting in the beer, which yeah. is like what Jake said. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, that, that's I'll, that. This is why we serve the beers to blind participants because Jake going into this may have developed some sort of a a, a little key, right? Uh, kind of a trigger that he uh, knows that these beers are different, but it's just that one tiny little thing, and so that's what allowed him to distinguish them so consistently and confidently, as he says. Uh, so we did serve these, or he served these to twenty blind participants out of which 11 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us to say with any sort of confidence that these beers were reliably distinguishable, that they were different. And out of those 20, 12, 60%, 12 tasters actually did uh, uh, tell the beers apart. We're able to uh, pick the odd beer out, which is significant. Tasters could reliably tell these beers apart. So now not only is this biased brewer uh, who made these beers as similarly as possible, can he tell them apart? consistently and confidently, but so can 12 out of 20 uh, participants, which allows us to say that there probably was a perceptible organoleptic difference between these beers. Now, when people uh, are able to, when we get a significant result, when people are able to tell the beers apart in our experiments, we actually have them compare the two beers that are different. They don't know that that's what they're doing uh, and just pick one, the one that they are, they prefer the most. And this again, I, I hate the preference question, except for when it returns results like this because it cracks me up. So <laughs> so out, out of the 12 people who uh, who picked the, the odd beer out, who were correct in the triangle test, four of them preferred the beer made with the six-row malt. Four of them preferred the beer made with the two-row malt. Three had no preference despite perceiving a difference, and one person you know, just said that they guessed right and perceived no difference. That speaks volumes. And to me, it screams, you have to figure this out for yourself. You can't just trust your friend and their preferences. You need to try these things for yourself to see what you like more. It may very well be that the secret sauce is six row malt and you've been avoiding it because you, you know, you're out, you've been told that it doesn't work well in beer. Four out of 12 people prefer the six row American lager over the two row American lager. You might be one of those people. And I think that opens up an avenue for you to explore you know, in, in your own brewing what these malts can do to your beer. Right. I mean, you mentioned the domino cascading, right? The one gene difference. Is that really cascading into all these different flavors? Right. Uh, you know, that, that actually resulted in a difference in this experiment, right? Tasters were able to tell the difference between two row and six row beers. Now, the preference data was obviously split, right? Nobody had a strong preference <laughs> either way. But that's cool to know, right? This is another tool to put in your brewing toolkit, right? Um, maybe like Marshall said, maybe the next batch should be like a six row, 40% rice, you know, rice um, and versus a two row with 40% rice yeah. or a blend of two row and six row. I mean, these things might really be tasty. Um, it'd be interesting to me too, to see if we could uh, you know, figure out like what, what, you know, what the difference actually is. Like, what does it taste like yeah. uh, when people taste these two beers differently or was the Domino, you know, the OG that was slightly different. And then that was the FG. I'm very suspicious that that's the case, yeah. <laughs> that that was <laughs> causing all that much of a difference because I've brewed a number of beers that have been that close that have uh, not come back statistically different. But again, this is a really cool one. So it's two row versus six row, at least in 100% of the malt bill, um, were, tasters were able to taste the difference. That's a pretty cool finding and a takeaway and not something that I expected, uh, you know, whenever I was reading this article. So, Well, I'll tell you, my expectations uh, originally, I guess I would have presumed that they would be different, kind of, kind of yeah. like the way Jake found. But then after doing the research, and, you know, years and years of us obsessed homebrewers kind of digging into the stuff, I, I, I was kind of going along the lines of what you and Pat talked about that these really aren't that different. But hey, I mean, this seems to suggest that they are. And when it com you know, the, you combine that with Jake's personal experience, which is purely anecdotal, we accept that, it, it does seem to suggest that there might be something there. Now, to me, the whole OG difference FG difference uh, isn't a big deal, uh, but it is something you might want to consider if you're going to try out six row malt, you know, maybe, maybe expect a little bit less conversion. But 
ultimately in the end, you're probably, I mean, you're probably going to get away with what you normally do anyways. So very interesting findings. And uh, this was one that actually got quite a few comments. So I selected a few uh, to address on this episode. The first one comes from Brendan, who says, really interesting. Thanks for this. It might be interesting to do a similar experiment. Oh, here you go. But with high adjunct amounts. <laughs> We've already talked there about we go. that. We, we inceptioned <laughs> ourselves. It was probably that comment that inceptioned us. Um, <laughs> and, and we just hadn't, hadn't forgotten it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that'd be a fun one to do pretty soon. I, I definitely want to, I am, I'm going to claim dibs on it. If any of you other contributors are out here listening, um, I want this one. <laughs> yeah, Kate, I, I'm with you, man. And I, I think it would be really cool. I think what we should do is probably like, uh, you know, some, something would be like uh, 60% six row or two row, but then the re- the other 40% would be like 20% flaked maize 20 percent, you know torrified rice or something like that so that yeah, yeah so that yeah. you got both in there just to see what happens i mean it would be fascinating if in this experiment you know you've got the the lower conversion in the six row malt the six row malt seemed to have slightly lower conversion but when blended with adjunct it, you got higher conversion or something i think that'd be fascinating yeah. uh finding so we're definitely going to do that brendan and i promise you i didn't steal your idea i, we, I think we were just thinking about <laughs> I, I like your your inception comment there kate we may have very well have been influenced without knowing it by Brendan's comment there. Next comment comes from Jay Karanka, who says British brewers used quite a lot of U.S. barley before World War II as not enough barley was grown in Britain. They also imported from Belgium, Turkey, Canada, parts of Africa, etc. Same with hops. Some of the barley used in British beers was six row and bought on purpose. See, that kind of goes with what I was talking about earlier and what I'd read somewhere else is that we know that British people, you know, the British brewers way back in, in you know, pre-World War II were importing uh, six row barley malt. Now I thought it was because of, of like treaties or, or trade agreements and stuff like that. But, but obviously they liked the beers that were being produced with it. And according to Jay Karanka, they were intentionally seeking six row barley to use in their beers. Yeah, cool. I mean, that, he's got a link on the uh, on the website too for their uh, to Barclay Perkins, which is a fantastic uh, you know historical beer blog. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that's pretty that's cool to think about. You know, it, it sounds like there wasn't enough barley grown in Britain, but they could have gotten it from you know Germany or who knows where else. Uh, and and so yeah, Six Row was actually you know was achieving brewing purposes for Britons, which is pretty pretty cool to see. Yeah, I mean, I have to dig into that uh, that uh, that post and see uh, read a little bit more about it and figure out. Um, if we can <clears throat> sort of figure out what differences six row and two row have in a sensory uh, perspective, which would be a lot of fun to to explore. Yeah, definitely. Final comment comes from Greg, who says, I really enjoy six row. I almost prefer it to two row. I think six row has a grassier taste, which pairs nicely with piney hops. I'm not sure if it's by bias, but I feel I get less stuck mashes with six row than with two row. They both have their place. Ah, huh, interesting. So six row having a grassier taste. You know, that that's interesting because I, I think with like harvest, which was the, the yeast that Jake used on this uh, experiment, a lot of people, I think even you, Marshall might have been one of the people that that talked about it is getting this like slightly vanilla or slightly like har- harvesty or like hay character uh, to the beer. I wonder if that compared with the six, six row was paired with the six row was <laughs> just enough to like nudge it uh, for enough uh, uh, enough brewers uh, to to get the significant and or enough tasters to achieve significance in this experiment. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, and six row having a grassier taste, but that's exactly kind of what I want to dig into and understand a little bit more about is like what flavor does six row have Um, because as I mentioned earlier you know we had a whole bunch of six row with adjunct and then now we've switched to two row uh, with adjunct are we going to start switching back to six row? Are there things that six row can still do for us as brewers that we want? Um, and it's something that's interesting to explore. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, when, when I read uh, Greg's description of six row malt as imparting a grassier taste, it made me think of what Jake referred to as a dirty taste. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I, again, I'm, I'm in my conversation with Jake when he wrote that. And I was like, what do you mean by that? It, it, he wasn't talking, you know, when you, you talk about like a clean fermentation character. What we're talking about is that the fermentation character get you know the yeast gets in there gets out of the way and you taste the malt and the hops and whatever uh, i i don't think he was referring to dirty as the opposite of that version of clean i think what he was talking about is like dirt like that earthy kind of you know, yeah. what what greg may be describing as grassier uh, uh grassier taste and I, i'm not sure i would like that even with piney hops but again preference is preference it's subjective uh, what you like is what you like and and nobody needs to convince you otherwise one of the things that drives me crazy i was talking to my kids about this the other day they were like oh we were talking about some fast food yada yada whatever and they're like oh such and such is the best flavor 
I was like, well, you know, maybe to, maybe to you it is, but it's certainly not my favorite flavor. I hate Rocky Road ice cream, you know, like no, I, well, I, then you're just wrong. Marshall, see what I'm, I'm saying? Yeah, see what <laughs> yeah, I'm saying? No. And I feel like that's an argument. Anytime we do these ingredient comparisons for brewing stuff, it, 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 that is the argument that I have to I have to come back to is just because we showed that there's there seems to be this difference when using six row over two row doesn't mean that one is necessarily better than the other. And in terms of the brewing side of things, and they both seem to be fairly similar. You know, you're going to get similar conversion. You're going to get all of the normal stuff that you expect from you know mashing malted barley. Uh, it really comes down to, or boils down to, no pun intended, uh, the the personal preference and what you like the most. So I hope uh, you know with these types of experiments and us talking about them that that's the impression that we leave uh, all of you listeners with is that go out and try these things for yourself. Make a one gallon batch. Make a couple one gallon batch one with two row, one with six row. See what you like for yourself. And again, you may very well find that going with a six row route does exactly what you want it to do to, to bump up your brewing game and to, to make these beers a little bit more pleasurable for you. And so that, that's what I hope. Uh, Cade, that is all we've got for this episode. Do you have any final comments for our listeners? I couldn't agree more. We've got so many levers to play with as brewers. This sounds like it's now something that, uh, not now something, it's always been <laughs> something that you can choose to brew with, right? And, and it may change the ultimate flavor impact of your beer. So yeah, if you're interested in making an American lager, throw some six row in and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Well, don't forget to subscribe to the Brew Lab uh, podcast where Cade takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no.